Christians. All right. So today we will look into community. Everyone say community. Okay. Before we look into the passage for today, I've got an exercise for all of you. All right. Church is a place of a gathering of believers. All right. A gathering of believers. A community. And I've got an exercise for you all. A challenge. And probably it's a big challenge for some of us. After the service, you go around and have a conversation with someone you've never had a conversation before. Or at least go to a person that you have been longing uh, to, you're wondering, you know, what, what's that person's name? But you never, <laughs> never find out ever, ever since the first day you came here. All right? I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you, after the service, go to a person you never had a conversation before or ask the person's name. Because I feel like if we want to live in a shared community like this, uh, at least know the person's name. I know all of your names. All right? I know Dawson's name also. All right? So I I'm not trying to brag here, but if I want to be a part of community, I want to be able to know your names. Jesus called you by your name. You know? When Jesus knows your name, uh, he knows you. He knows you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Amen. So come on, go around, find someone you have not ever, maybe the young and the old, the old and the young, it doesn't matter, but you've never heard of that, you know, you've always seen that person every week, uh, week in and week out, but you never, you know, never, uh, what do you call it? Never knew that person's name, never had a conversation with. Do it today, all right? Do it today, okay? Let's look at the passage. Ephesians 4 verse 1 to 6. <clears throat> it says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You know, before, before Paul, this is Paul uh, writing this, bef before Paul came into this major transition that happens in chapter 4, he, he, he talks about, it talks about everything in detail of what God has done for us from chapters 1 to chapter 3. And so this is where Paul talks about what God has done for us. And when he comes to this major transition in chapters 4 onwards, he talks about how we should live rightly. How uh, Paul says it is a call to live rightly. The focus switch from knowing God, knowing what God has done, to how you and I, the believer, should live in response. And so we should walk worthy of our calling that's what paul says worthy of our calling it means to live lives fitting appropriate conforming to our calling philippians 1 verse 27 says only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of christ is it is your life fitting to the gospel of christ if your is your life appropriate to the gospel of christ colossians 1 says from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7 to 8 says, this is when... John, the John the Baptist, right? He saw many of the Pharisees coming to his baptism. And he said, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. So when we really understand how much God did for us, when you actually understand the encounter, the first encounter that you have with Jesus, we will naturally want to serve Him want to obey Him, but not out of obligation, but out of gratefulness, because God saved us, because God has, what has done for us. So understanding who we are is the foundation of this worthy walk. 
Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10 says this. This is very famous. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. I don't care if you're really good with your Bible or how many verses you memorize or how many things that you've done for the church or for His, uh, for His kingdom. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast for we are His workmanship, we belong to Him, God created us in Christ Jesus for good works. Hear that? It is not God, God calls us for good works, but He first tells us, no, you belong to Him. You are made by Him, you are created by Him for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them, worthy of your calling. So, this means that we don't walk worthy so that God will love us. But because He loves us. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know what's the difference? You don't walk worthy of your calling. You don't walk in your, your Christian life, you know, blameless or righteous, just as uh, Enoch walked, you know, with God. You don't walk worthy so that God will love us. We walk because He loves us. It's motivated by gratitude, not of our desire to earn merit. And so through this narrative here, God has called us to belong to Him, be part of His holy people, and to join in His plans and His purposes for our lives. Right? The passage that we just read, Ephesians just now, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. You know, Paul is saying this now. He, he was earnestly persistently urging us that's what urge means a strong desire a strong impulse no? basically to beg us to persuade us that's what Paul is saying to the church of that time and two things he, uh, he implies he says this you have been called church when you are called that means there is a caller <laughs> there's no brainer if you have been called that means there is a caller and God is the caller which means to say we don't live our lives worthy of our own calling or our own personal conviction we live our lives based on God's sovereignty just now in, the, in this morning when we learn about the book of Ruth alright sometimes you know uh, whether, whether the Ruth planned this out la, Naomi planned this out la, but at the end of the day uh, something just connects that's the sovereignty, you know. God's purpose still prevails, you know. Alright? And so, we are to cling on His calling rather than on our own personal conviction. Next slide, please. Cling on His calling rather than our own personal conviction. That's the first thing. Paul says, you have been called. God has called you. Secondly is this. He uses the word you as a plural sense, in a corporate sense which means God did not call us just individuals. He called us individuals to be part of this collectiveness. That means that there is a, uh, all of us individual as God's people together. That means that we are to live out our individual calling in the context of a community of other called people. So, Vivian, you are, the, you are, you are one called people. Yima, you are one called people. Uncle Dominic, you are one called people. But together, you are doing it, you are, you are, you are, you are living in worthy of your calling with other called people. Isn't that amazing? And I'll tell you, tell you something uh, powerful about that. So, we are meant to live in community with other believers. That is one of the pillars of a Christian life. Your Christian life is not to go to just some cave, live out your life there alone that's not what you're supposed to be christian uh christian discipleships only can take place in a community you can't do your discipleship alone one. of course we some days we need alone time with the lord but our integrity our patience our kindness our love all of these things will be tested if only we live in a community and so with that in mind, we also, as a community, we have to actively pursue unity. When we live, first of all, when we recognize, when we live uh, a manner worthy of what God has called us to do, the calling, 
unity will take place. And I'll show you how later. Okay, there's a statistics here. Lah. I found out research shows that 65% of Protestant churchgoers say that they can walk with God without other believers. More than half of Christians are less concerned in actively pursuing unity, true unity, community. And they are, you know, avoiding church for a more individual-centric faith apart from Christian community. Of course, I, I believe there are many reasons why this happens. But how do we curb this is that you individually, you must first live a life that honors God through obedience, through diligence, actively learning to live humbly with patience, with love, with grace, especially when we live in a community like this. There are some people who are difficult, you know, but the Christian community can be a taste of God's kingdom, heavenly kingdom here and now. If only we understand the importance, the significance of being in a community. So my first here, I'm going to go through uh, uh, verses by verses. So how do we walk worthy of our calling is my first point is that have a principle of humility. Principle of humility. Ephesians 4 verse 2 says this, uh, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Alright? There are actually, technically, there are actually four things that what Paul is doing, uh, uh, asking us to do. But I just want to focus on humility. Because I feel like if you practice the principle of humility, I think everything else will come and follow. So Paul gave this principle of humility as the foundation, all right, and as a response to live an alive worthy of our calling, a foundation to maintain the unity of the community in the body of Christ. Right? Paul reminds us that we need to clothe ourselves with humility. Right? Humility paves the way for genuine unity. What is humility? Right? Humility is this. Humility is thinking more of others. We need to start thinking like servants, not consumers. You come to church, if you want person, you come to church and all you want is something out of everyone, it is not healthy. There is a two-way thing. You want to consume from people, sure, but there is also a contribution as well. There must be a two-way thing. Because you're coming to church, uh, it's not just a club. You come to church knowing that you are going to be with a gathering of believers, with one another, knowing that you're worshipping the same God. We can all come from different backgrounds, but we worship the same God, serving one another. So we need to start thinking like servants, not slaves, servants. Real servants of God think more about them, uh, others Think more about others than about themselves. True humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. When we shift our focus, you know, from just what we want to others what we need, we will start noticing the needs around us. That is what I want to, that's, what, that's the community I want to be in. That I know that if I help one another, I, when I, I know that I'm serving one another, I know that somebody is serving me as well. We are helping one another. We are loving one another. You think about Jesus. Jesus humbled himself by emptying himself. How? In the form of a servant. He said this, I came here not to, uh, not to be served, but to serve. And when was the last time you emptied yourself? When was the last time you went out of your way for someone else? When was the last time when you come out from your bubble, from all that you know, from your familiarity, and go about and be a good Samaritan, where nobody else will want to do it, but you will take that step to do it? You see, you can't be 
call as humble or a servant if you're so full of yourself? Jesus emptied himself. Um, and it's difficult, uh, of course. It's very difficult to do. But we are to do the same just as Jesus that did for us. Now, a lot of our service, unfortunately, all right, for many, many churches, okay, not just for this, it's often self-serving. We serve to get others to like us or we serve to get, you know, admired. We serve to, you know, get something out of people. We serve to achieve our own goals. Sometimes, if you're not careful, being a servant can also mean to get something out of people. But real servants don't try to use God for their purposes. They let God use them for His purpose. And I know it's tough. It's really tough. Because we are all selfish by nature. That's why staying humble is a daily struggle. And just like what you say, pick up your cross Deny yourself. Self-denial is a principal call of a true servanthood, a, a call in humility. And so the measure, the extent of our servant-like attitude becomes evident in how we handle situations, especially where others treat us more like slaves than servants. How do you respond? when you're overlooked? How do you respond when you're told what to do? How do you respond when you're treated less important? I, I get treated like that also many times. But the Bible says so clearly, five verse, Matthew 5 verse 41 says, if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. Such a it's such a hard principle to take in because all of us we have we're quite egotistical you know, some, you know, at some level we want things our way we want our voices to be heard you know we don't want, we don't want to be taken advantage of all of these things are true but use the occasion to practice the servant life Jesus was beaten stripped whipped, hung on the cross. If he did not practice the servant life, we will not be here today. You know, another way of, another, one of the ways I check myself to be humble is to ask this question to myself and some of my, um, my close friends. Is that, I ask this question, am I difficult to love? Am I difficult to love? Because if I am, I probably have to rethink, why, why is it? I think you will be humble enough if you can ask that question. Because nobody likes to be, you know, how to say, being told, like, how to say, uh, given constructive criticism. I don't like it. I don't like being criticized of what I know that I can do is best. But I need to know that, you know, um, there are other people here in this community. Not everyone sees the same way that I do. So I asked this question to myself and some of my friends. Am I difficult to love? The church is a place where grace must abound if we want to live in a community of true unity. It should be a place where people feel safe to bring their struggles, their sorrows. Yet many people, with good reason, do not feel safe at church. It should be a place where we escape cultural binds of politi uh, politics, sexism, racism, uh, bigotry. We must be a, co a community. This church must be a community humble enough to listen to others, understand where each of us, where one another is coming from. This is very important. The reason why the church, Big C, uh, the church is struggling to reach people is and the young people are leaving the church it's, maybe it's because it's less about not teaching them strong theology. It's that we taught them well, but we don't leave them out. And young people can see this. And I was, when I was growing up in this church, 
there was a lot of couple of times that I want to leave this church. In fact, I want to leave the faith. Because I know and I see that some people, they don't live out the truth. They preach the truth, but they don't live it out. And so, this is so important that you live your life worthy of your calling. Jesus has brought you out of darkness and into the light. Into the light. Walk in the light. Live in the light. And I can guarantee you that when people see the way how you live your lives that honors God, they want to honor God as well. I want to be in a community who live a strong, close relationship with God, who is humble, love, live the life and the principle of humility. And I want to speak on behalf of the young people here. So for all of you young people, you know, if, if children and youths and young adults, if they can't find Jesus here, they'll find something else out there. They'll probably also find a wrong Jesus out there. Do you know that there are cults out there who are teaching the wrong kinds of teachings of Jesus? If they cannot find Jesus here, they cannot find within the walls of this community, they will go looking for something else. So the principle of humility is so important because in community, that's where we want a, 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 a genuine unity. Secondly is this, very quickly now, power of diversity. Ephesians 4 verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul eagerly asks us, uh, asks us to eagerly maintain unity. Paul did not ask us to create unity. God never asks or commands us to create unity among believers. Because why? God has already created it by His Spirit. Our duty is to recognize it and to keep it. All in this bond of peace. Peace is what that glues, the, glues us, sticks us together in a community. You know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemaker. He did not say blessed are the peacekeeper. He wants us to make peace with one another. He doesn't say like, oh, let's keep the peace, make sure that conflict doesn't take place. Conflict sure will take place. Differences of opinions will sure will take place. But it's only when we learn to make peace. And that requires a lot of humility. Peacemaking. Peace that is the one that glues us together. All for the benefit of the church. Alright? So Paul is speaking about spiritual unity in a community that we'll do our best to keep the unity by making peace with one another. A lot of us here, we come from different races, different nationalities, all right? Okay, our family here, Emily, they just arrived uh, last week from uh, Congo, all right? All of us come from different languages, all of us come from different economic classes. And just like the body of Christ, everyone is made up of different parts of the body. And this mix of diversity, differences, this mix of differences should make the church stronger instead of causing problems. How? Be humble. See and appreciate what the other person can bring. Don't think you're the... You know what, what the Bible says? I, I forgot where it is. Like, basically, paraphrasing it, don't think you know it all. Right? Don't think you know it all. Don't think you're always right. God gives us a diversity within unity uh, so that we can learn to work together. That's the power of diversity. It should make the church stronger instead of uh, causing problems. Di and, and the thing is that this diversity in face value may seem uh, impossible to achieve unity. But it's only possible through the unity of the Spirit. So when we are here, who are we recognizing? Are we recognizing the pastor to, 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 lay out, to, to lay out the foundations of the unity here? Are we depending on the board? Are we depending on you know, all of this? No, we are depending on the unity that is given by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the, ones, is the one who unites us. 
So when we come to church, the reason why we do pre-service prayer is not so that we can just pray for whatever is going to happen in service. It's to get your hearts right, to recognize that God is the, Jesus is the head of the church. So that whenever thing, everything that we do reflects back to the glory of Christ, and then peace, uh, unity, and peace can be attained. It is the common faith that we have in God that works together for the common purpose for His glory. You and I, we have all kinds of differences, but it's because we look to Jesus, look to the Holy Spirit that unites us, that brings us in unity. You know, we often think about how the church does important stuff for Jesus. But the real power of the church comes from how Jesus works in us through it. The deal is, as we grow up in our faith with Jesus, it's going to be all about being part of a community. We likely will get more mature by hanging out with godly friends, hanging out with different opinions, different backgrounds, it's okay. But because we worship the same God, when we worship together, it's not just each of us worshipping God, laying our own personal altar to Jesus, no. But collectively. You know, I get, you know, sometimes when I'm in front here, I sometimes, when we are worshipping, I sometimes look at the back. Because you know why? Not because I want to spot check you lah, alright? It's because I get encouraged when you lift up your hands. I get encouraged when I hear your voice singing out the songs. Because worship in the church, all right, worship in a setting, a gathering of believers like this, is communal. When you take Holy Communion, Holy Communion is not, a, a, not just a personal thing, you know. Holy Communion, taking the Lord's Supper, is supposed to be a communal thing. One day, one of our worship encounter service, right, remember that? One day, I'm going to design a worship service that surrounds the Lord's Supper. I think the Lord's Supper, the, the, what do you call that? The significance of the Lord's Supper is being diminished a lot already in churches. Why? Because we take it as an appendix to the service. Alright? We take it as a by-the-way thing. But the Lord's Supper has so much significance because you're not just remembering what God has done for you, but you're doing it together, communally in a community sure jesus heals us when we jesus heals us jesus delivers us jesus gives us a breakthrough but when you do it com in a commun uh, in, in a community it brings so much encouragement so if we want to be more if we want to walk worthy of our calling we've got to do it with everyone who's in god's plan just that includes you and i whether if we click with them or not, I don't think that matters. As long as we focus the fact that we are doing it all for the unity of the Spirit that He has given to us. You know, um, uh, you know, you know, you know for, for some of us, I think, I know when you're growing up, children, uh, when, you, when you send your children to school, right, then you find out your kids are hanging out with this troublemaker. You know, uh, it's a real troublemaker lah, in the school, in the class, or whatnot. And uh, I, I read somewhere, all these kids troublemakers are that they that your kids hang out with or whatever are, they are called character builders. They are called character builders. They help our kids grow socially and emotionally. Some kids might learn to stand up from themselves for themselves, while others learn to be kinder or learn to be more gracious you know character builders and most of the most of the time when we see our kids hanging out with people like with other kids who are like that bad influence probably the first thing that we do is that don't hang out with them you know come to church more often right i think it's the same way i think church has character builders all right i think all of us we come from different backgrounds and different opinions with so much diversity that can help each other to build characters can help us to exercise certain things in the church all right like more patience more kindness more love more grace church is not a perfect place 
newsflash. It is not perfect. It has all these perf- imperfections. But that's where we are, help each other. All right? So because at the end of the day, when we do worship services like that, when we do programs, events, or whatever, we do it at the, at the end of the day is to glorify God. It is not to show off how good of a church or how productive of a church that we are. It is all reflects back to the glory of Christ. Character builders. So that was my second point, power of diversity. My last one is this, pursuing God's grand design. And as a community, you must first have a principle of humility. As a community, you have to understand that in diverse, through diversity, we can achieve unity. All, in, all, all from what God has given to us, His Spirit has given to us. And the third one is this, pursuing God's grand design. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6 says this, There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I think you all can understand that the theme of this verse is that oneness. One. This highlights the unifying factors that binds us as believers. That is supposed to be the foundation, the grounds. One body, the church, one spirit, the Holy Spirit, one hope, eternal life, one Lord, Jesus Christ, head of the church, one faith, belief in God, one baptism, spiritual rebirth, which is, by the way, water baptism is so important. All right? Water baptism. If any one of you who have not been, have not been baptized, in water you know come and see me we'll we'll do something for you we'll arrange some classes and some lessons for you water baptism is not a means to just get membership in the church or that you can have a right to vote or whatever water baptism is a public declaration of your private life you know i i I read a quote somewhere is that um you cannot um how say you cannot live Something like you cannot live publicly for Jesus if you don't, you're not, you're, you know, you're not, you're not ready to live privately for Jesus. Something like that. Integrity, yeah. And so if any one of you who are not, uh, not baptized in water, that come. Because water baptism is a public declaration. It's so important, alright? What, what's, what's the significance of it? Anyone knows? Why do you go into the water? And why do you come out from the water? Why do you go in the water? Those who were baptized when? Yeah. And you come out again out of water because you are alive in Christ. That is so important. And Paul emphasizes all of this. And he transcends human differences. Elevates our focus to God's grand design for His people. And when we understand all of these elements, we will have to learn how to put aside all of our divisive attitudes and minor disagreements, concentrating our shared allegiance to Christ. So living out our calling to follow, love God, love others, it might seem easier to do it alone, but that doesn't mean it's right. We are are all inherently hungry for what only community can bring and that is belonging and a shared purpose a part to play in God's grand design you and I we have a part to play in God's grand design a community sharing relationships to a shared purpose a community sharing relationships to a shared purpose. You know, you don't have to find your purpose in everywhere else. You can find your purpose in God, what God has given to you, in relationships that we have here in our community. You can find it. You can allow God to unlock that purpose out of you in communities like this. Because actually, we all share the same purpose. But of course, God has given us specific ones a specific calling to all of us individually. 
but we can live them out in community, knowing that at the end of the day, it is all for God's grand design. So don't look for, don't look for guidance in the wrong places. Instead, come to church. For those of us who are not here, uh, for those who are not here has not been coming to church for a long time, encourage them. Encourage them. Like I said, this is not a club. And remember what I said in the beginning. After this, meet with someone, talk to someone that you have never ever had a conversation with before. Or at least learn to know that person's name. Because that will be the only, the first step to be living in a community. This is what I want because this is what I desire of our community in this church. That we will live in a culture not of individualization, but a culture for each other. A culture who is willing to sacrifice so that we can be a channel of God's restoration for one another. A channel of God's peace, a channel of God's blessing. Just as how God has blessed us, we can do the same for others. So, come to church. Or if you don't have a life, or, or, or you, you want to go deeper, go for a life group. Life groups are where we can share life together, do things together, being honest with one another. If you don't have that kind of community, and right after this, you chow, you balik home, stay, you know, do your own thing. I can tell you, you can only grow. One of the things that you can only grow in your Christian life is to be in a community just as God designed it to be. I'm going to come to my conclusion here. And I want to share this verse because I... I found out, uh, I, I, I think God revealed something so important to me. It says, Matthew 18 verse 20 says, you know, For where are two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. You know, we always quote this verse, especially in gatherings like this, right? Pre-service prayer, la, prayer meeting, la, Sunday service. La. We always use this one, but do we actually understand it or not? The fact that is that you are never alone. God is always with you. But what this verse is saying is that when we come together in His name, whether it is a life group, whether it is a youth gathering, whether it is only two or three people, whether it is an event, a program, a Sunday service, a Bible study, a Sunday school, whether it is only two or three, there is this compound energy that comes with it. And that God is uniquely there in the gathering and He blesses it. So whose name do you come to church today? Do you come in your own name? Do you come in your name of your own father? Because my father asked me to come here. My mother asked me to come here. Do you come in the name of, oh, I'm worship leading today. I'm doing the ushers. I'm handling the tech. In whose name are you gathered here today? In Jesus' name. This is so important because when you are here, two or three are gathered here, God is here in this place. I mean, God is omnipresent. God can be anywhere, anytime, and any, pla uh, any place. Everywhere, He's omnipresent. But when you are gathered with me and I am gathered with you, God is here. Now, I will give you an illustration, a Lego. You know Legos, right? I found out on a research. I'm, re I'm re going to finish here very quickly. You know the eight start Legos are uh, eight got the eight starts right. I found out that fun fact about Legos is that if you put two Legos together, all right, there are twenty four different ways that you can put two Legos together. If you have three Legos, there will be one thousand sixty different ways that you can put three Legos together. And if you have six Legos, you can have you can put nine hundred and fifteen million ways different ways you can put six Legos together. You know, you can be a Christian and just be alone with God, but there is a divine power when it comes to gathering. You can start and lock and see the different ways God can use you together with one another, all for His glory. From the beginning of creation, God created man and woman. Being alone was never the plan. God did something about that and create fellowship for humans. I know, sometimes 
Am I difficult to love? That person is difficult to love? I know. But at the end of the day, who unites us? The Holy Spirit. Community is having meaningful, intentional relationships. I'm going to finish here quickly, but when I was in the silent retreat, right, when the facilitator said like, okay, silence, uh, done really, you can have conversations, right? The first thing when we talk about, uh, when we want to have conversations, uh, the first thing we talk about with one another is what we've learned from the retreat, you know? Like talk, talking about the retreat, talking about stuff, you know? And so, I, I just thought of, I, I, got, I, I got a reflection of that, I just thought that, you know, in community, it's not just having relationship, I know who you are, you know who am I, that's it. But like intentional meaning relationship with one another. That's so important. We do life together reflecting what has been going on in the week. We encourage, we serve, we forgive. Don't talk about, Ayo, why, why people are not coming to the church? Why people are not coming for prayer service? It's okay. You can take the step, go out of your way, empty yourself, go and visit that person. Maybe you see one of the two of them next week. Oh no, sorry, next month we have Holy Communion, right? Holy Communion is supposed to be a communion thing. If you see one or two persons that are not here in church able to do Holy Communion due to probably physical disabilities or whatever, why not you go to the house and do Holy Communion with them? God wants to use you for a grand design only when you are in, only in a community sharing encouraging serving forgiving chasing faithfully after god and my last point is this learn to show up in each other's life in the magnificent or in the mundane can we all stand up and we're going to end this service hallelujah Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we, we come before you, O oh God, knowing that, Lord, you have created us for fellowship, for relationship among one another. Today, I pray for your Holy Spirit, God, to convict into the hearts of your people, to live in humility, to pursue unity, to pursue God's grand design, to understand and see that each of us are different, diverse, but all comes with a purpose that is community. Help us to live in this community, O oh God. Help us to learn to forgive. Help us to learn to, um, to, to, help us to learn to forgive and be humble. Help us to learn, O oh God, to serve. Help us, O oh God, to learn how to encourage one another, O oh God. Hallelujah. Help us to learn to show up in each other's lives in the magnificent or in the mundane. Thank you, O Lord. Hallelujah. Can we all lift up our hands in such a way that we will receive the blessing of God? Hallelujah. May the bonds of community grow ever stronger among us, weaving threads of unity, compassion, and understanding. As we go forth from this gathering, May we carry the spirit of togetherness in our hearts, extending a helping hand to our neighbours, nurturing a sense of belonging for all. In the, tap uh, in the tapestry of our lives, may the vibrant colours, different, different colours of community shine brightly, reminding us that we are stronger, kinder, better together. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All God's people say, Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give God a big hand. Amen. Alright, we have five minutes left for the, the EGM meeting. Go ahead and do your business, go toilet or whatsoever. And then come back here, meet up here again.